Okay, welcome everyone. We'll just uh, give us a few minutes while we uh, make a start, just waiting for people to join. Might just give it one more minute and then we'll make a start. So, welcome everyone. Okay, Caitlin, should we make a start? All right, welcome everyone and uh, to the Dynamic Operating Envelopes uh, work stream uh, webinar. This is a culmination of 18 months worth of work and a great opportunity for the panelists that are joining me today uh, to talk about the work that has been done and the report that has been released. I'd like to start by acknowledging that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands uh, around Australia. I'm coming to you from the Gubi Gubi uh, lands, uh, that is in the, the, the Sunshine Coast region of Southeast Queensland, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. If I could just go to the next slide, please. So the agenda for today is John and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, DEEP for those that, of you that haven't had much exposure to DEEP. Uh, then we'll go into the Dynamic Operating Envelopes work program that has now coming towards its, uh, its final few uh, work, work uh, tasks. We will then hand over to Andrew to uh, discuss what is a Dynamic Operating Envelope Marie will talk to us about the social license considerations for industry to uh, implement dynamic operating envelopes. I'll then hand to Ed to talk about some of the reforms and some of the considerations that ESB and market bodies are starting to think about in regards to the implementation of DOEs. And we will finish with Q&A. So there is, uh, before I go on, there is a chat uh, Q&A link at the bottom of your screen there. Those uh, questions will be collated throughout the sessions and will be looked to be addressed when we get to the Q&A session. So as you go, if you uh, have questions, burning questions, please put your questions in there and we will look to address those to the panelists that are on the call here today. So uh, yes, if we could move to the next slide. So John's just going to talk to us a little bit about DEEP. Thanks, Craig. So um, yeah, welcome everyone. So many of you may be aware of DEEP. So DEEP is really a collaboration that started a, a few years ago where um, the parties that you see listed there came together and identified a bit of a gap in the system around a collaboration on the rapidly uh, evolving and, and, you know, um, very dynamic space that is DER integration. Um, I think the, the underlying premise was that there's a lot of formal processes in the market systems um, to, to address these issues, um, rule changes and AER guidelines and the like. Um, but the, the pace of change just really required another layer for people to come together in a much broader uh, circle, I guess, to um, you know, to identify what the priority issues are, to bring forward initiatives that can accelerate the integration of, of uh, DER. And it's been operating for a few years now with annual work plans. So I think this is the, we're going to 2022 now with the, um, was it the fourth annual work plan? 
um, and and the dynamic operating envelopes work stream was part of last year's work plan and we're presenting on the outcomes of that today. Um, if we go to the next slide. So really, uh, so DEEP doesn't, isn't an organisation. It doesn't have a, um, a formal role in the, in the energy market. Um, and it's really, it comes together around areas that where there's a common interest and where there's a sense of shared priority. So often that's things where we see, we know there's a rule change or a reform agenda coming up in the future, or there's a technology change happening in the market. And we get together and we talk about well, what can we do as a sort of a collective to accelerate our thinking on that and um, really just get the system ready. It's very much focused on um, outcomes for all consumers, not just those with DER. And we've got a bunch of sort of guiding principles you see listed there, which, um, you know, which I guess make it, you know, really, you know, focused on what, what the issues are at the time. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility in what we do. There is a uh, LinkedIn group, which you can join. Uh, if you just search for dynamic, uh, sorry, for distributed energy integration program on LinkedIn, uh, where we provide updates on things. Uh, Arena is sort of provides a, an administration role uh, for DEEP and supports various work stream processes. Um, but Arena isn't, uh, doesn't own DEEP. This is a sort of collective initiative of the industry itself. Um, and that's I'll probably hand over back to you, Craig. So uh, this is just a timeline of all the work that's been done in this dynamic operating on launch work stream. So um, a lot of work over about 18 months, starting with the establishment of the work stream where in September 2020, we got together. Um, we could see that a number of utilities and innovative companies were developing up dynamic operating envelopes there wasn't necessarily national consistency in regards to how they were doing it. And there weren't um, common standards or um, a common knowledge around how dynamic operating envelopes could benefit consumers. So that's where we started. Um, we then thought you know, we need to start with the customer in mind. So we wanted to develop up some principles and we had a workshop uh, straight after looking at the customer's perspective. We then went into having another workshop around the regulatory and policy design for dynamic operating envelopes and look at uh, how we could um, get towards national consistency. Uh, that was followed up well, by another workshop uh, in mid-year last year, looking at the principles which informed the um, report and we have held, we have commissioned two reports, one looking at um, the readiness of what we're calling home energy management systems, um, uh, where what, how ready are those products and services uh, to respond to dynamic operating envelopes, and another report which is soon to be released looking at the readiness and um, the thinking within network businesses around utilising this type of technology. Um, and uh, from that point, we have spent a lot of uh, uh, days as this group of panellists on this call pulling together an outcomes report. And I'll talk to that on the next slide, please. So this report was released uh, probably three, four weeks ago now. Um, it's a culmination of input from the panellists on the call here today. Uh, it, is really focused on the export only functionality of dynamic operating envelopes, although it acknowledges that there are other um, potential future use cases, but to keep it simple for the scope of the, the report, we primarily focused on export only um, functionality. It is focused on the connection point. So some have talked about you know, dynamic operating envelopes or some functionality of communication around hosting capacity directed to devices. Um, we stopped short of that and we're focused on that at the connection point and there's some reasons for that that we'll talk to. And we have also um, acknowledged that there is um, still a lot to be done in this area before uh, this becomes a um, 
a, a fabric of the energy system in managing and coordinating the hosting capacity of decentralized in, uh, energy systems. So the logos that are, are littered through that page have all contributed to this report. Um, it is not one party's voice, it's all their voice. We have co-authored and uh, gone through a process of co-designing that report and um, through that process reached uh, conclusions on 27 findings. And those 27 findings look across both technical matters, social license matters, and uh, regulatory and policy uh, considerations for implementing the, this as a tool in regards to how do we increase the hosting capacity of networks uh, and eff effectively facilitate more exports of energy from people's homes uh, as a result. So that's the report, it's available. We we'll, we'll, might put uh, out after this uh, a link to the report, but it is there and the, the, um, it is also available on ARENA's website for those that want to, uh, want to go through it. So I might now hand on to Andrew, if we can just move on. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Craig. <clears throat> so just firstly, a quick recap on what DOEs are and a brief introduction for those that aren't familiar with what they are, what the terminology is. Um, so DOEs really, as a concept, represent the guardrails of the network capacity um, and we can think of it more as a dynamically changing um, set of limits. Um, and as Craig mentioned, we're primarily focused on just export limits, although that, that can be applied to the import side as well. So um, we do have import um, and export limits today. Um, they're set by the DNSP. They're really just static or fixed limits at the moment. And so for DER um, and the export side, that's really you know, the maximum amount of DER that can be installed. And this looks something like um, around five kilowatts in, in many areas. Um, although in some cases that's been wound back to, to zero export um, because of the, the network issues that have been experienced. So by dynamically varying the operating envelope, we can, uh, we can allow DER to export more at times when the network capacity allows it. So think of that as shoulder periods or other periods where there aren't, aren't constraints on the grid, um, as well as dynamically varying them by location. So in areas where there's stronger network connections or more capacity available for customers. So um, as we said, um, just focusing on the export side of the, of the envelopes here at this point. Next slide, please. So how are the DOEs calculated? What do they actually look like in practice? Um, so it's really um, from a technical and a technology point of view, there's, there's three steps outlined here. So the DOEs are calculated by the DNSP. They're transmitted um, to the devices or made available to the devices by um, a communications link. Um, and then the devices um, pick up these envelopes and are free to operate within the limits that are, that are provided. And so the DOEs, the, the calculations themselves can be pretty basic to begin with um, and can become more accurate over time um, as they're needed to become more accurate, but also as the DNSP systems and data quality improves. Um, and there's been a lot of projects that have been looking at different aspects of, of how the calculations are performed um, and you know, different approaches are being taken by different DNSPs to suit the, their needs and their um, particular data, data and systems um, at, at present. The communication device um, or the communication to the devices is becoming standardised. So um, hopefully you're familiar with the CCIP OS now that um, has been released in its first version. So that's um, an adaption um, and adoption of IEEE 2030.5. Um, with the addition of a CSIP OZ, um, a common smart inverter profile uh, for Australia, which, um, it, which adds the, the DL capability on top of that standard. Um, that's uh, a lot of work that um, DEEP have done, um, has supported that as well as a lot of the other projects that are, that are working in this space at the moment. And finally, um, providing, I guess, a, a certain uh, envelope 
to DER allows them to operate within a range um, and that should uh, result in a greater range of services to customers. Next slide, please, Caitlin. Oh, sorry, back one, actually. Oh, we seem to be missing a slide there. Maybe just, yeah, we'll just jump forward to the next slide, please, Caitlin. Thank you. Um, I think one of the key, key takeaways that um, we as a group have here is that um, DOEs uh, are certainly more than just the technology that's required to make it work. Um, there's certainly been a lot of focus on the technology um, in the development of that through, through various projects at the moment, but consider this to be you know, an entirely new process that um, all, all businesses and stakeholders in the process need to start to, start to build um, the rest of the maturity around. And so that, that considers technical capabilities, um, certainly. Uh, there's a lot of work happening in different projects, as I've said, to, to really focus in on what is technically required for DOEs to be generated and transmitted and you know, secure and open standards. And um, certainly a lot more work to go there to really round out the maturity of that. But importantly, there's also the socio-economic um, and regulatory areas that um, we're still really, you know, in many cases, just beginning on a journey there. So we're gonna hear a little bit more about the, the social license aspects to, to DOEs a little bit further. Um, as well as some of the actions that we're, we're um, starting, only really starting to, to kick off um, through the regulatory reform process. Um, the benefits for customers are, um, uh, are actually quite profound. Um, there's a lot of work that's going on to try and um, quantify exactly what the benefits, you know, the material benefits for customers are. Um, but we're already seeing results coming out of projects that are, are showing you know, a doubling, at least a doubling of capacity for customers. Um, and the additional amount of energy that they'd be able to, to export into the grid um, is actually quite material. So um, it's great to see, see that from, you know, primarily from a DR customer point of view. Um, but customers overall can benefit from greater market efficiencies and greater network efficiencies. Um, so you know, increasing the amount of DR available to the market can you know, create other market efficiencies at other times, um, and that flows on to all customers. And, and likewise, work from a network efficiency point of view, um, greater utilisation of the network and can create um, lower costs and greater efficiencies for, for all customers, not just DR customers. Uh, so thank you. That's uh, that's. Um, really just the recap of, of DOEs and the benefits. Um, I'll hand now to Marie to talk about the social license aspects of DOEs. Thanks, Andrew. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Marie. Uh, I work in the Energy Services and Markets team at Energy Consumers Australia. Um, so on behalf of ECA, my colleague, uh, Melissa McAuliffe, um, who will join me later on the panel, um, we contributed to the DOE's outcomes report where we concentrated on chapter three, uh, which is building a social license for DOEs. Uh, so what is a social license and why is it important for a DOE program? In 2020, ECA worked with uh, Cutler Mertz to publish a report uh, on social license for, for consumer energy resources, such as solar or uh, batteries. The report defines a social license in the context of these resources as the informal permission granted by stakeholders for institutions to make decisions on their behalf about the operation of their energy uh, resources. So it's really about establishing and maintaining the trust between consumers that institutions and organizations are offering programs and making decisions that have their best interests at heart. Establishing a social license requires the benefits of the program to be clear and easily recognizable to the consumer um, and outweigh any potential costs or uncertainties. Uh, and this is even more important if the program is mandatory and consumers um, have no option but to participate. So while the report does outline uh, the potential benefits of DOEs and explains that consumers should be able to opt in or out, uh, there's still a lot unknown about how a consumer would perceive and experience a DOE offer and benefits. So we definitely need to do a lot more work gathering consumer insights um, and experiences from current trials to ensure we're designing uh, a program that works for consumers. Um, so, so why is establishing this trust and social license so important to a DOE program? 
DOEs might may they did while DOEs may represent a more efficient way to manage the network, realizing their benefits uh, will actually require consumers to choose a DOE over a static limit. With little consumer buy-in into a DOE program, the overall benefits might be limited. Um, and without that social license and trust, consumers could just perceive a DOE as a type of control over their investment, which they bought um, with specific expectations uh, and intentions on how it would perform. So in other words, we can't isolate the technical challenges of the transition to a low carbon grid from the households and small businesses who make up the energy system. So how do we start to build this social license? We need to start from consumer values, motivations, and expectations. These resources are ultimately consumer resources invested in for particular reasons and with certain expectations on how they will provide benefits for them. For example, not all consumers might be motivated by the cost saving aspects of um, solar, they might have chosen a battery or solar for the environmental, um, for environmental reasons or for independence uh, from the grid. So if we don't understand and apply these consumer expectations or motivations, then designing a DOE program that will realize clear benefits for consumers uh, will be much more difficult. Um, next slide, please. So establishing a social license also means we need to bring consumers along the journey through effective and clear communication. Currently research indicates consumers have very little awareness of the challenges uh, associated with the uptake of solar, suggesting many would not know or understand maybe what an export limit is or if they have one on their systems. Um, we need to provide consumers with access to clear information on these issues uh, and we need to uh, and we know from social science research that when looking at information, consumers aren't necessarily weighing up expert um, information or making rational cost benefit analysis. So they're instead just looking for information from a trusted source that they believe is aligned with their values. So it could be a neighbor, a friend, a local Sparky. Um, so creating this, creating the widespread community acceptance and buy-in is an important part of establishing um, a successful. DOE program. So if I'm leaving you with one key message today, it's that social license and consumer acceptance of a DOE program is critical to realizing any of the system-wide benefits of DOEs. As if in the end, consumers just don't want a dynamic offer as they don't believe it will deliver them benefits, then they might choose not to take part. Uh, building a social license and trust for a DOE program is also an important foundational step in future consumer energy resource programs. If consumers don't have the positive experience now, they might be less likely to trust in the future. So it's important uh, we get this right. And I think with that, I'll hand over to Ed. Thanks, Marie. Uh, next slide, please. So before I go into the, the recommendations that we've selected here, I just want to um, say that the report it's yeah the first and the beginning of the discussion there is a lot more that needs to be done um, it's the beginning of the journey and we certainly uh, be looking forward to working with um, all of the industry in in seeing how this develop and with that in mind um, we actually had 27 actions in the doe outcomes report and what you see on the screen here is just a selection of the ones that we felt um, people might want to hear about today I'm going to spend my time talking about the technical capabilities on the left, uh, the green box, and the one on the on the right, the rules and regulations. Um, that Marie has discussed a lot of the the social license issues already. So on the left hand side, and technical capabilities, again, sort of emphasising on the start of the journey. A lot of what we've recommended here are things that uh, would improve learnings and improve insight. So yeah, there are a lot of trials going on by a number of DNSPs looking at different aspects of using um, dynamic operating envelopes. So it's, it's important that uh, going forward that we take learnings from them. One of the key recommendations that we have on the second one is a communications protocol, uh, which is the CCPOS or the REEE 2030.5. Um, looking solely from a sort of DNSP communicating to the, the customer side, um, the working group's view is there needs to be a consistent platform so that you know, whoever takes that uh, signal from the DNSP don't have to work with multiple um, different communication protocols. It's also important that we consider what the potential fallback behavior is. So if we do lose comms, uh, what should the device do? And the remaining two are sort of talking about long long range forecasts. So if we can provide consumers with both, well, in fact, both consumers and market participants in the case, 
what the long range constraints are um, and that will help them actually both look at the investment and how they operate their own devices as well. In terms of calculating the envelope, this is an area that needs uh, a lot of work. Um, our view is that the methodology itself needs not to be standardized amongst networks, but there should be a process um, looking at methodologies as well. I'll go to the rules and regulations and then I'll come back uh, very quickly on the social economic considerations. From a rules and regulations perspective, um, Craig has already mentioned our work, um, yeah, the goal is looking at nationally consistent approaches. The expert reports that we've looked at in through our work here talked about the NSPs, um, almost all of them, um, if they haven't already started trials, they are certainly considering implementation in the next five to 10 years. So it's important that if this is going to be a feature of the future grid, uh, that we'll have a nationally consistent approach. Our view is given that this is an early stage discussion, if we were to get the industry on the starting block, the envelope should initially be allocated at the connection point. Uh, this is not ruling out any future development where the envelope can apply at various parts of, uh, of the supply chain, but I think uh, the connection point is a good place to start. And along the lines with socioeconomic consideration, but also um, sort of technical capability, we've come up with a few principles on allocation. Again, that's subject to further consultation and different DNSPs might take that on um, as part of their rollout or their trials as well. Um, I won't talk too much about device control hierarchy, uh, but suffice to say that uh, the same communication pathway or the same technology that enables DNSP to um, implement dynamic operating envelope can also be used by other parties, other participants. And if you have multiple parties uh, wanting to influence the operation of a device, then um, a hierarchy needs to be established. Just going back to the, the middle box here, um, Marie talked a lot about we need to have consumers, customers on board, and if we don't have their social license in um, to, for this happen, I think it will, would um, fly. So uh, the, the recommendations here really talking about giving consumers and users the choice to opt in and out. And again, yeah, this is beginning of the journey that that would be the, the starting point. Information provision is quite important. Um, if you look into the report, we have a chapter uh, dedicated to sort of the consumer journeys and the various information that consumers would need to have from you know, when they first purchase solar panels to considering whether they uh, would opt into a DOE approach. And lastly, um, again, Marie talked about this, we, we need to consider this in the realms of benefits for all customers and not just for um, you know, those who, who have the ability to opt in. Uh, with that, I'll stop here and I'll hand over to Craig. Okay, so next steps here, and this is a good lead into some of the uh, questions that we will um, go through in regards to where do we take all this? So as Marie discussed, social license is an ongoing matter beyond dynamic operating envelopes and is uh, an ongoing um, important element of any change that goes on in the sector. And so that's uh, that will continue. Um, I will ask Ed and uh, Phil and Christian to maybe uh, kick off the questioning in a minute in regards to what they see as the reforms that they need to take forward to enable this uh, to be something that can be as I said before, built into the BAU fabric of how we manage decentralized energy systems in the, in the, the network in the future. Uh, and uh, we will also, throughout the Q&A, talk to uh, ENA rep representatives on the call uh, in regards to what they're doing in pilots and in some cases, such as what SAPN is doing in um, already implementing dynamic operating envelopes through their flexible connections. So if we just move on. So before we go to questions, um, we thought it'd be a good idea just to highlight some of the 
projects that ARENA has supported that are already looking at developing innovations in these areas. This isn't the only projects that are looking at this, and there are projects that go well, be, well beyond ARENA in regards to their exploration of uh, dynamic operating envelopes and how we can dynamically rate the network in better ways. So many of you would be aware of many of these projects. The slides will enable you to hyperlink to details and knowledge sharing reports in regard, regards to these projects. But it does show that there's a lot of people uh, across industry really exploring and looking to evolve this technology uh, across the sector. Uh, I should also say that, you know, ARENA's work um, as a, you know, a supporter of innovation in the sector doesn't end here. We would still be open to having further funding applications, further uh, discussions with people around how we can extend this uh, technology, our investment priorities, um, particularly around supporting load flexibility is a key priority for us. Um, our, our challenge as we become uh, deep, more decarbonised in our energy system uh, is that we will have excess energy, particularly from solar in the middle of the day, if we can flex our demand or um, make more dynamic our networks. And this is something that Arena is willing to continue to support. So with that, I may go to questions if that's okay. Um, we could probably lose the slides and just get the faces up if that's okay. So I might start by going to particularly Christian, uh, Ed and Phil in regards to market bodies and ESBs thinking in regards to how do we evolve uh, where we are today to that, as I said, more BAU making this as, as part of the fabric of the energy system moving forward. Um, noting that already companies like SAPN and others are already uh, implementing these technologies and these ways of hosting DR on the network. So I might start with Phil, if that's okay. Can we start with you? Thanks, Craig. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Phil Blythe here from the SB. Uh, just to give you a quick synopsis of uh, what the SB's role is in taking forward the uh, work, the great work done to date by industry in getting uh, dynamic operating envelopes to the point where we can now integrate it into the system. Uh, we have the DR implementation plan, which has been um, approved by ministers for us to implement over the next three years. Uh, has m multiple streams of work, but I'll just highlight that the sort of the key areas, key touch points that this has. Um, obviously, bringing in effectively guardrails or system limits across the the, the system is a, is a pretty major reform. So it's actually one of the key reforms we want to get in early. Uh, and due to system security risks across the system, as we get a more volatile system, it, it, the imperative is for us to to deliver that as as quickly as possible. Um, and make to make sure that 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 dovetails in well with a lot of the state based um, initiatives already underway. Uh, so probably the first thing to uh, just quickly uh, point out is the the customer insights collaboration. One of the key challenges, and we and uh, we we just heard um, from the ECA on the social license issues, is just the complexity issue associated with all of these new reforms. It isn't easy for customers, and we need to take a step back to understand how customers are going to receive this along with a whole bunch of other changes that are happening to the system and how we can get them comfortable. Uh, so the customer insights collaboration is really about trying to look at that social license, but also in the context of it's just a, a very a continually changing system, um, operating envelopes and limits are, are one part of that. And so we need to understand sort of the the, the customer perspective, um, the more insights we can get to feed into the regulatory processes, the better. Um, but look, I'll, I'll, the, the, there's some other pieces that are um, more concrete. And I think specifically, um, I'll let Ed talk to uh, the, the regulatory side about how we're going to look at governance uh, across um, DOEs and some um, other parts of the um, technical standards um, 
work work streams and also to let Christian talk uh, to another really important piece of work, which is how are we going to regulate uh, uh, and what type of regulation, regulatory changes do we need to think about such a significant reform as, as uh, putting these uh, limits uh, in and across the system. So ESB's role is to try to coordinate and connect with all of these pieces. Uh, a lot, most of the work is being done by other market bodies where, where we have a timeline to, to stick to, to ensure that we get the reforms in, uh, in, a, in a timely manner. Uh, as I said, consistent with state-based schemes and and consistent with keeping this, the system uh, working, um, the most important thing. Um, so with that, I'll over to uh, to Christian maybe to, to kick off on, on his piece. Thanks, Phil. Um, yep, so as alluded to, uh, the AER is commencing a program of work at the moment to review uh, essentially the governance arrangements around the framework we're going to be examining uh, or essentially developing a set of policy criteria to evaluate implementation options for DOE um, and we're going to extend this to have a think about you know compliance enforcement we're also going to look at the customer protections um, angle of you know DOEs what might need to change we're conscious that uh, you know the authorization exemptions review and issues paper is expected out fairly shortly on that, and that's being run internally in the AER. So we will be collaborating with our colleagues on that front. We're also collaborating with the network tariff team because we think there's a natural fit there to kind of look at the way the network tariffs interface with DOEs. So it is quite um, it is quite broad, but we are looking to publish our our first output will be an issues paper uh, mid year. We expect it to be done by. Yeah, end of June, um, and then we'll move to a directions paper later in the year, probably towards the end of Q3. So I would recommend keeping an eye out for that. We may look at some um, public forums after the issues paper is published to discuss some of the issues raised, uh, but we'll see how we're going closer to the to that date and the kind of um, interest we're getting. Thanks. Um, I'll pass over to Ed now. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Um, Setting the social license issues aside, there are a number of technical and regulatory things that we need to look at here as well on the technical front, um, standards and yeah, various standards that may or may not need to be applied in um, rolling out DOEs. It's something that's pretty high on all the market bodies agenda. So the AEMC is going to start a review on uh, DER technical standards governance Later in, in the second half of this year, um, we've only just published our final rule in um, in a request to have a governance framework set up. So our plan there is to look broadly across the entire st uh, standard spectrum from what standards are needed, when they are needed, um, all the way to the other end about compliance and enforcement as well. Uh, I think across all the market bodies, we certainly recognise the need to have standards. Um, a lot of these sort of technology requires yeah, commonly accepted protocols and then standardized way of operating. So we'll be looking at that as part of our, our review. And, and definitely we've heard from stakeholders that yeah, the compliance is, is very important. It, it's all well and good to have all the standards written into the rules and mandatory, but if there's no inf uh, enforcement and compliance, uh, it doesn't mean very much. So we will be looking at that as well. And on the regulatory side, the the movement towards sort of the operating energy resources, whether it be import or export, at the lower end of the electricity system means that the the, the old role of you know retailer doing something, networks doing one thing, and then there are a little overlap that that's changing. Um, it's already changed now, so we'll be looking at what. DOE technologies like this mean for different participants and just making it clearer so that we don't have the overlaps. One of those overlaps, the, the clear expectations on who's responsible for doing what part of the role in keeping the system safe, secure, um, but also you know, in the, achieving the customer's aim of having a low cost decarbonized system. Thanks, uh, Ed, Christian, Phil. So I might just start to roll through the questions. Um, we've got 20 minutes, and so we'll try and get through the bulk of those. Unfortunately, we may not get through all of them, um, and we will try to maybe group some of these. So I might start with just a, a hope here, a, a direct question from Tim Ryan in regards to why we didn't look at uh, imports. 
And I think he had a follow-on question in regards to the social license needed for consumers in regards to broader engagement and looking at how we get low-cost solar uh, into the system without spilling excess solar. Uh, and I might hand that one to John, if that's okay. Sure, thanks, Craig, and thanks, Tim, for the question. So uh, probably, um... Probably the way to think about it is that the, the consultation that led up to this report has been you know, went on for, for about 18 months, a lot of workshops, a lot of different stakeholders involved in that. And, and the issue of the application of the DOEs to, to load management uh, came up frequently throughout that. Uh, people do, a lot of people do see that as a potential um, beneficial future use case. Um, throughout the process of, of preparing the report, um, it really funneled down to what I guess the, the group considered were the immediate priorities and making sure that we had a scope that was um, able to be um, yeah, hit, the, hit the ground at the right time and also reflected the consensus of the different parties that were involved. Um, you'll see in the report that there is sort of shout outs of potential future use cases, um, but at this stage, um, the, the you know it, it wasn't considered that we had enough information or sufficient consensus to you know to, to really define how that should happen um there are obviously a range of issues around that you know when you think about you know consumer essential services loads and things like that and how they could be affected so there's a whole raft of kind of regulatory and consumer protection issues that need to be worked through before you can really land um, a solution there that said, there are a number of trials underway and, and different market bodies are, are looking at different options um, that could enable that in the future. So it's a really important space that we, you know, we're going to be um, watching closely. Um, DOEs do, however, provide a incentive for load management um, to the extent that in the middle of the day, uh, exports are constrained. So that obviously provides a very um, direct incentive for consumers to shift their load into the middle of the day, whether that's you know, water heating or batteries or whatever it is. Um, so that that is a, effectively becomes a free electricity source during that period of constraint. So, so we do think it'll amplify um, existing incentives for load management, um, complementing tariffs and, you know, different and, and the other incentives that exist. Um, in relation to your second question, um, I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that the this, this work hasn't sought to pick winners in terms of you know, small scale batteries behind the meter versus community scale batteries or, or other kinds of solutions that, um, you know, that, that might arise. Uh, it really is focused just on the fundamental issue of how do you make the best use of existing network hosting capacity? How do you allocate that in the most efficient and fair way um, in real time, uh, making sure that the overall, you know, outcomes for consumers are maximized. Um, I mean, it's really interesting to think about how DOEs could be applied to community storage, and certainly that's a you know that's a possibility both in, you know in, in the future potentially in a bi-directional sense because they they have the same challenges ultimately operating within grid constraints. So, um, but that's not something that's been focused on, and it's not something that um, the report seeks to kind of steer the conversation one way or another. Thanks, John. I actually thought I might come in as well. I think that raises a number of very interesting points. Uh, one of the fundamental drivers of the, of the dynamic operating envelopes is that we are recognising how to, trying to work out how to release the, all of the spare capacity that sits in the network that's not used at peak times. Um, and that Australia is very different from the rest of the world in as much as that we have a solar, more solar installed on resident, residential rooftops than anyone else. And so we're, we're dealing with that challenge at the same time. And the, the DOE in its first in, instances is there to to ensure the system remains protected, sort of like a, a more dynamic fuse, if you like, than, than what we have today. And the, the intents to allow the consumer still to make choices within that those limits. So it's not to use that to the limits to actually tell the consumer what to do, but rather to open up options for markets to operate more freely and, and it to better out, for better outcomes for, cons for consumers in this space. Um, yeah, thanks. So I might pivot now to the experiences. There may be a number of networks on the call today that are uh, contemplating dynamic operating envelopes. I think it's fair to say, and you'll see from our, uh, our, our network's readiness kind of report that there's different levels of maturity. I might now hand to James and Andrew. Um, James, maybe starting with you, 
There's a question from Rama just talking about what are some of the no regrets technical decisions that you might make in regards to transitioning to DOEs. And, you know, Andrew, you know, follow on with some of your journey in regards to um, your perspective on how you're going through contemplating uh, DOEs. So James, over to you. Thanks, Craig. Um, I think from our perspective, it's relatively straightforward. We think we need um, the uh, technical standards for devices to be able to receive and enact on dynamic operating envelopes be embedded at a national level uh, to encourage um, you know, inverter manufacturers to support the capabilities. And then that kind of levels the playing field for customer choice when it comes to choosing what inverters to put in. Um, and, when, and when DNSPs want to implement dynamic operating envelopes, all the capability is already available um, for that to work. And I think there's a couple of aspects to that. There's the, the application of the CCPOS or the IEEE 2030.5, which gets you the communications part of the uh, stack. Um, but there's also some um, overhaul required in the um, device standard space as well. So we think that the inverter functions need to be considered and, and the response that they might have um, in response to the remote DOE signal. And so we think likely that fits somewhere like um, AS4777, um, mirroring some of the work that's been done in the US around um, incorporating standardized inverter response functions in response to, to remote signaling. Um, and having these standards in place will not only set us up for dynamic operating envelopes, but it will also set up devices to, to be market participating in the future as well. So it's almost like foundational technical capability that we think needs to be there. Um, and we think as well, it, it makes sense for networks to, to begin to invest in their LV um, real-time forecasting capability to support DOEs as well. But I'll probably pass over to Andrew to uh, flesh that out in a bit more detail. Thanks, James. Uh, yeah, just for everyone's benefit, I'm sort of stepping in to help out with ENA today. So I'm representing the ENA, just to make that clear. And from a perspective of the networks and the calculation methodologies on dynamic operating envelopes to answer uh, Nando and Rama's question on those technical capabilities, I think it needs to be recognised that we are at the beginning, that there is a lot of trials in these areas that DNSPs are trying out different methods. Uh, so it's important to uh, take those lessons learnt. Some of them are being learnt now at various different stages. And there's also very much a spectrum of the trials trying out dynamic operating envelopes that are reliant on less data um, and uh, sort of maybe not like the seasonal approach versus some very like five minute reliant on forecast and moving forward. So I think it's important to note we're at the start, trying different things, learn these lessons, but also it's important that all the networks have different um, data sets. So part of what is being mentioned in the report is that don't we don't need to get tied down in sort of the calculation methodologies. Each network will do it. We would potentially be doing it quite a bit different because even to think about how do you do your um, get your feedback from how the operating envelope came back. Like it's in Victoria, there's Amy infrastructure. Other other networks have lots of transformer monitoring, some different have different other approaches. So it's just to, there's a bit of a separation between that calculation, how it's then shared. Um, and yeah, as James mentioned, it's important to work on those allocation principles. And then there was a question from Alex about uh, networks and their investment in uh, the utility service. So the work that's been done under Project Evolve has developed an open source 2030.5 server, and that's sort of been going into the CCPOS, James, uh, the South Australia Power Networks leading their flexible exports project, uh, has also developed a sort of another utility server um, in that project. So there's, there's two sort of solutions that are will be uh, compliant with CCPOS. Um, so there's there is those investments being made to date and most networks are either in the process of procuring one or procured a 2030.5 utility server. Uh, where we, how it works with other protocols, I think is uh, part of the next steps and sort of how does it fit into other interoperability standards as well as James mentioned. Thanks. So, so perhaps I'll just quickly add there um, that uh, as mentioned, we think, you know, no regrets getting these communication standards in place is really important and the sophistication of the DOE envelope calculation in the back end can increase the, over time as, as networks build up their capability to get more monitoring telemetry data 
and improve their capability to do short-term forecasting. So we really think that getting the communications architecture in place is kind of really power, paramount. Um, and also just adding that we think that the CSIPOS is flexible enough to cover a number of other business models and use cases, including market participation and other things in the future. So if we get those standards in place, then it will help support not only DOEs, but broader DR integration in general. We might pivot now just to talk a little bit more about social license. Um, it's ringing my ears, Gavin Dufty at the NA conference, you know, did some quick calculations. So if every customer spends about $50,000 over the next 10 years, or say 5 million customers spend about $50,000 on DER, uh, that's about $250 billion worth of investment by customers in DER over the next 10 years. In relative sense, you know, the, if you add up the RAV value of every network in the country, it's about $100 billion. So you know, customers are investing a huge amount of money in their own energy infrastructure here, you know, much more than the overall value of over 10 years of the entire network of the East Coast of Australia. So I'm interested to hear more from you, Marie, and maybe Melissa in regards to social licence and, you know, what customers are uh, we need to really consult with customers on in regards to this. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Yeah, definitely. I think um, critical to remember that these are ultimately consumer resources that they bought with a wide variety of expectations on how it would perform and uh, deliver um, for them. And um, I think that's key to a, a DOE program that would be taken up by consumers, you know, being able to show them exactly how they would benefit. I mean, yeah, the kind of direct benefits. I know too, there's some questions about in the chat about equity um, and grandfathering and understanding the lived experience of the consumer, which is part of the social license question. Um, and I think speaks to something that Mel and I um, addressed in that chapter about what does this look like from a consumer's perspective? Uh, what's the journey? What's the process? Um, you know, starting to tease out some of those lived experiences of different segments of consumers as well. Uh, you know, there's new solar customers, existing solar customers, non-solar customers. So um, I think it's really important that we start to kind of tease out this, ex this consumer experience while we're still developing. And I mean, while, the, while DOE is still, um, we're still learning, I guess. So Mel, I don't know if you had anything else, but. Thanks, Marie. Um, I'm, uh, Nando in the questions has asked about calculation methodologies and um, they may not need to be standardised. Um, there's been a lot of uh, findings around um, common uh, communication protocols. Uh, I know that Andrew and Anthony, you've spent a bit of time in this area. I might start with you, Andrew Fraser. Um, in regards to your views around, you know, Project Evolve and some of the other projects in the market, how do we bring what may be slightly different approaches to a, a more standardised approach? Good question. Thanks, Nando. <clears throat> uh, I think James and, and Andrew McConnell touched on this a little bit already. So the um, the the position that you know, was discussed quite at length within the working group was how do we, you know, can we standardise um, allocation approaches and calculation methods? Um, and I think we quickly arrived at the point where um, a lot of the DN different DNSPs are starting from different positions in terms of um, needs for accurate DOEs as well as um, a base capability within their network model um, and data accuracy. So. Um, we often, you know, there's, there's a huge spectrum of, of different needs there. So there's some DNSPs that won't need really accurate, um, you know, accurately sort of load flow based calculated envelopes for some time. Um, uh, whereas in sort of specific areas where, where there are really tight constraints and you want to squeeze every, every last watt out of the network, then there, there is probably a case for for um, you know, investing in the, the systems and the supporting data that's required to really squeeze that out. So um, the, the overwhelming view was that we don't want to mandate some very accurate 
um, and detailed systems, which would add cost um, in areas where they're, where they're not needed. So, and I think just to address that, we did separate sort of calculation methods and allocation principles as well. Um, and um, certainly the, you know, the, the different approaches to allocation, be it, you know, sort of broad brush at a feeder level versus um, individual, individually calculated allocation methods um, is again one that really needs to be worked through with the different customer and customer groups as part of that social license exercise. Thanks, Andrew. And adding, adding to, as, as Andrew sort of pointed out, each of the states as well as that very different levels of PV, uh, for photovoltaic solar penetration. Um, there's some who is, where it's very small, less than a tenth potentially of, of rooftops and others where it's now almost approaching 50% in some places now. Um, flipping to the other side of the coin, the in the future, if dynamic operating envelopes are indeed taken up en masse by consumers, there is also an emerging role that the AR is starting to look at now in terms of just what is the compliance. So there's, there, there is envisaged that there will be a future oversight of the performance of the networks here. And have they offered the, have they met the obligations they offered to customers when they signed up for these contracts? And also uh, potential benchmarking, uh, if you like, of, of delivery outcomes and which and how the network's performing in this space and that's an existing role of the AR in, in many areas and that and when we see a mass adoption of DOEs if we do um, you would expect that 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 role may well be picked up by the AR as well without committing them to Christian there to any to anything specific in the future. Okay so I might move now there's a question in the chat from uh, various people talking about the interface between tariffs and dynamic operating envelopes. And I note the you know, export charging elements of access and pricing incentives rule change. I might hand to you, Ed, in regards to you know, what you're looking at. I know um, Project, Project Edith is looking at some of this. I'm wondering if you can comment on that. Yeah, thanks, Craig. I, I might just go a little bit broader. In the ESB's work on DER integration, we're considering various aspects of work to actually help um, make the DER and all the customer investments part of an integrated future grid. So we're looking at both technical solutions, market facing solutions, as well as sort of regulatory levers. This work on DOE is one of those aspects. And in our view, it works, it needs to work very closely with all the other things. So for example, um, DOE and tariffs are not mutually exclusive. So you've got the DOE being the technical solutions in saying, look, there is a physical limit on how the network needs to operate. But within that envelope, this is where tariff comes in. So there are um, different networks. And I'm, I noticed some of the retailers starting to do that as well in, in using pricing, different reward structure to in, indicate to customers how they can actually get more value out of their investment. And in this and it's more than just the export side, it's also the lim uh, on the import side. So the access and pricing rule change really emphasize the need to reward customers for what they do that can benefit the grid. So it's actually providing uh, yeah, positive pricing, solar, uh, solar soaker type tariff that works with other aspects. Um, cool. Short thing. So we've only got a few minutes to go. Um, I think there's a question in regarding security of systems, and I might ask um, I might ask AEMO if they could either Matt or Steve can talk to some of the security concerns or considerations you might have in regards to you know growing volumes of DER and and def and also these greater communication links and how they may. Um, impact the broader system. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Uh, morning all, Matt Hyde, AEMO here. Sorry, my camera's decided not to work today, so I'll just keep rolling. But you know, one of the one of the benefits here within DOEs, as we've as we've talked about, is you know the ability to enable more export out um, for for less augmentation across. The networks, which is which is terrific, but we also need to keep an eye on the the system security risks that can be apparent from all this um, 
uh, from all this energy being pushed into the system and things like, you know, minimum amounts of, of system low being required to, at this point in time, you know, keep the broader synchronous fleet operated and providing those synchronous services that we currently only get from them. And as we move through that transition, we can we can look at more advanced capabilities, but over the, the next five years, we need this minimum level of, of functionality to be able to, you know, balance that supply and demand. And so that's where DOEs can, can do that more in a more advanced manner than, than just a, a, a purely, you know, contingency and minimum system load mechanism where we move through those those three layers of of response when we're in these um, system security conditions that they might be able to that might be giving us some some broad up power system bulk power system um, problems in in just not moving down to that that third level which is the emergency backstop of being able to more dynamically control the level of, of export out so we can just you know curtail it to the extent that um, that is needed to keep the to keep the system in a secure operating state um, moving forward and and that'll enable consumers to keep exporting more energy that we all want them to do okay all right well let we might finish up there given we're just a minute over. I appreciate all the panelists and all the people who have been involved in this uh, work stream. Uh, big thanks to Caitlin and Celia that have helped pull this um, webinar together. And I note there was about 120 people on this call, so you may still have residual questions. And I think all the panelists would be open to uh, having a direct conversation with you uh, after this. Um, we will be sending out slides after and links to the report and really appreciate uh, your attention over the webinar. Thank you very much.